today we're going to be talking about the global carbon cycle. We didn't talk about this with the rest of the cycles because you really do need to know those chemical processes we talked about last time, like photosynthesis and respiration to understand the carbon cycle. So carbon exists in the environment in all of these forms, and I want you to pause here for a second and get all these written down. You do need to know the general chemical formulas as well. Whenever you see something like this, where you have an X and a Y down here as the subscripts, it means that there could be different numbers of carbon or different numbers of hydrogen in that particular chemical. Another thing I want you to remember that comes with, along with this slide is the definition of organic. Remember from biology that organic molecules have both carbon and hydrogen in them. Non-organic molecules don't, so they might have carbon, but they're not going to have hydrogen. All right, another thing that's important to note with this is that we've talked about respiration already. Decomposition is basically a form of respiration. Instead of the organisms eating fresh food, they're eating dead material, but they're still breaking down that organic matter. And remember that respiration takes oxygen, and there that's why in areas where you have really high levels of decomposition, like when um, you have an algae bloom after eutrophication and it starts to decay, or in wetlands or on the floors of forests, you tend to have very little oxygen there because these organisms are using up the oxygen to make energy for themselves. And that's all part of this carbon cycle as well. So this is a very simplified sketch of the carbon cycle, and it might help you to either sketch this one out or one on one of the following slides. But it's a very complex cycle. All of life depends on this cycle, and it also involves all kinds of dead materials or abiotic materials that contain carbon. So here's just another way of showing it, again in a simplified form, and then we'll get into more detail here. There are three major parts to the carbon cycle, and at this point you should have already watched the HHMI lecture on the geologic carbon cycle. So that's sort of the long-term carbon cycle and the way carbon is regulated on Earth. And then in the short term, the natural part of the cycle is photosynthesis and respiration. And that again includes decomposition, it's how all of that biomass and energy is moving through food webs, it's happening on the land and in the oceans. Um, and then in addition to that now, because our human population is so large, we have quite an impact on the carbon cycle. And the three major ways that we do that is by combustion or burning of fossil fuels or biomass, making cement or taking carbon out of the ground in other ways, and deforestation, um, clearing land, or using the environment to make food for ourselves. When we do that, we are basically using that ecosystem's primary productivity and taking all that energy that would go to the other organisms in the ecosystem and harnessing it for ourselves. So at that point, that primary productivity, that energy is not available for the rest of the organisms anymore. So it may be helpful for you to pause on this diagram or on this one and just kind of review that geologic carbon cycle one more time that they talked about in the HHMI video. That's one of those major parts of our overall um, cycle. And what I want you to take a look at here with this picture, this is one of my favorite pictures of the carbon cycle. It shows it all being put together. Here's our kind of long-term um, carbon cycle, the geologic one. And you can see uh, the parts that he talked about in there. And then we have this really short-term part with the food web. And then we have our human impacts in here too. So you might want to take a second and sort of write down the steps here of what's happening. So in that long-term cycle, some of the carbon is being trapped and buried and turning into fossil fuels. It's also going to eventually make its way down into more of the center of the Earth, and that gets brought back up by volcanic activity, tectonic activity. Uh, we have our food chains at work here, where photosynthesis is taking in carbon from the atmosphere and turning it into sugars for organisms to eat. And then as the organisms use those sugars, it's turning it back into sea CO2 and they're breathing it out and it's going back into the atmosphere. We're showing here that combustion, our burning of these things is releasing that CO2 as well. So this really helps to pull everything together. This is a good one to sketch. Here's another way of looking at it and the one major thing I want you to po 
um, notice about this picture is that the same processes are happening in the land environments as are happening in the ocean. You just have different producers, you have different organisms in your food chain, but basically the exact same things are happening. So we have what we call carbon reservoirs in the atmosphere, and these carbon reservoirs are basically places that we find carbon. So I want you to take a second and pause it here and write down what these reservoirs are and where what types of carbon we tend to find there basically record this in for me. Now, when everything is going well, these reservoirs are all in a natural balance. And this picture represents the natural balance of those. So you can see that most of the time, all of the carbon is, well not all of it, most of the carbon is trapped in the lithosphere, in the crust of the Earth. And there's a decent amount in the biosphere, but it's actually the lowest amount. And the atmosphere is also one of the lower amounts. You can find quite a bit in the ocean many times, uh, but you can see that it's kind of trapped in these areas. And this natural balance is really important. And part of the biggest problem with the carbon cycle is that we're starting to really upset this natural balance. So we're taking all this carbon out of the lith lithosphere where it belongs, and we are adding it primarily to the atmosphere. We're also taking it out of some of these areas and adding it to the atmosphere, and this is causing major problems. So these are some ways that carbon is released into the atmosphere. We've talked about sources and sinks. These would all be considered sources of carbon. So pause for a minute here, make sure you have these all down. Carbon is also taken from the atmosphere in several ways. These are the carbon sinks. So again, we've talked about this. This is where it's stored for long periods of time. These are the things that are going to take that carbon out and make it so that global warming is not as big of an impact. So these are, are things that we kind of want to happen. Now, they also have some drawbacks, such as when seawater gets colder, you have more carbonic acid, and that carbonic acid can harm marine life. Whenever carbon is taken away from the atmosphere or out of the atmosphere like this, it is called carbon fixation or fixing carbon or carbon sequester sequestration. Um, and all of these are just different words to say it's being taken in and basically held in an area where it can't get out easily. So photosynthesis is our biggest process that does this. It takes it in as carbon dioxide and it fixes it into sugars and then those sugars become the building blocks of all the living things in the food chain that comes after the plant. And up until fairly recently, this process of fixing the carbon was a negative feedback chain that basically allowed us to keep everything stable. Uh, because as the temperature of the earth rises, the rate of photosynthesis increases because these plants actually photosynthesize more when it's warmer. And then they remove CO2 and that reduces the greenhouse effect, which means that the global temperature goes down. Uh, but the problem is we keep pumping more and more CO2 into this part to the point that the plants cannot keep up with this loop. And what we're starting to see is we're taking all of that carbon that should be down in these sinks down here, and we're releasing it back up into the atmosphere where it shouldn't be in this large of a quantity. And we're really increasing it by a significant amount, three to four gigatons per year. This is a huge, huge amount. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing that is through deforestation, cutting down forests, clearing land areas. And through doing this, we add one to two billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere every single year. And the way this happens is if you think about a forest, they, there's a tremendous amount of photosynthesis going on there. All this CO2 is normally being absorbed and then stored in the biomass there. There's some being emitted back by respiration because everything needs to get energy, so the CO2 is going to be a byproduct of that process. But it's a much healthier balance, and it's normally a carbon sink. It's going to take in that carbon. What we do when we deforest areas is we make this area a carbon source instead. So basically, we're decreasing photosynthesis because we're removing most of those producers. Uh, we're 
decreasing the biomass that you find in that area really significantly. You don't have trees, you might have grass and things like that if you're lucky, but they're smaller producers, not doing as much photosynthesis. And respiration generally increases, especially because decomposition increases. Now that you have all this dead matter around, it's being broken down, more CO2 is released that way. A lot of times we also burn forests in order to um, get rid of the wood so and, and the other things left behind. So that also adds CO2 to the atmosphere. So this is a tremendously destructive process. And if you look at the human population pattern, you'd notice that our human population really starts to jump up right around the Industrial Revolution. And the problem with that is that in the Industrial Revolution, we start changing the types of energy that we're using. And we started using a lot more of those fossil fuels. And we can actually look at data from ice cores um, and then data that's been collected in real life um, since the 1960s. And we can see this huge increase in atmospheric CO2. And it's very, very troubling for a lot of reasons. And you can tell that that increase is coming from the types of energy that we're now using. This carbon imbalance has given us the highest CO2 level in 20 million years uh, from all of the data that we're able to collect. And uh, there, right now we have 300 time higher CO2 concentration than in 1776. Um, annually, we're introducing between nine to 10 billion tons more carbon than we're fixing from the atmosphere. So very severe imbalance here. And you can see, if you look here, the green things are the ways that we're taking in that CO2, and the red are all of the ways that we're putting it out. And BMT is billion metric tons. So you can see that we're putting out many more billion metric tons than we take in, 20 billion more um, per year. And this is very, very troubling because if we look at the past 400,000 years where we've had the type of climate that we have today, we have never seen CO2 go this far. And what kind of follows from that is, is that if CO2 has never been this far and there's a very strong correlation between the amount of CO2 and the temperature, then that means that our temperature is probably going to go up. And that means that all the climate and weather patterns that we're used to aren't likely to still be in place. If we look at who's responsible for this, we use different types of energy depending on where we live in the world and what type of country we live in. But we find that the US is really the primary CO2 emitter. We come up worse than pretty much any other country, especially when you look at per capita, per person emissions. We are way higher than comparable countries. And that's much because of our lifestyle. And remember, all of this CO2 that we're emitting is increasing that anthropogenic climate change. It's increasing that greenhouse effect and trapping more, more solar radiation, warming us up. And we can actually do some calculations that will tell us how many degrees it could warm us up by. And scientists have done this in many ways. This is the part that's fairly controversial is nobody really totally agrees on the math, but most scientists have come to the consensus that we're looking at if we double our atmospheric concentration of CO2, that's a temperature change of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius, which is significantly more in Fahrenheit. Um, that could lead to all of these impacts here. Take a second, pause, write these down. And the other thing is we have to either find a way to deal with this or we have to find a way to stop. And this is where future energy policy is really going to come into play. People might look at these numbers and think they're not that serious, but I want you to just take a look at this for a second, pause here and think about what these mean. Think about how you yourself could be impacted by this. Also remember we have all these positive feedback mechanisms that feed into this and make it even worse sometimes. And this is also a social issue because a lot of the times the areas that are the most vulnerable to this climate change are the areas that are already in turmoil in our world. So tomorrow in class, we're going to talk more about this balance, get more into the carbon cycle, come in kind of prepared with 
knowing what happens and what goes on and how this carbon circulates. See you later.